Good evening, everyone. Lovely to see some of you again and some folks who haven't been here. You're very welcome uh, as well. And if you're watching the recording of this, it happened some time ago uh, for you. But we uh, thank you for looking and watching as well. So you are very welcome tonight. Thank you. The format of the meeting, very similar to the one we had last night. If you're here, we're going to open with a, a song. We're going to close with one. And in between, we're going to hear someone's personal story. And we're going to hear from the Word of God. And the theme for tonight is coping with addiction. And I don't know what comes into your head when you think about that. It's, it's probably one type of addiction, but there are many types of addiction and many types of people and walks of life. But we'll hear a wee bit more about that uh, when I introduce Albert and as he comes and speaks to us. We're going to pray and then we're going to sing a song. But before we do that, I've sort of been picking up a book. I'll try and pick one up each night. By the way, all the literature that's on this table or the one that you passed, if you come in that door, everything is free. And you can just take whatever you want uh, and take it home. If you want to give something to someone, you want to read it for yourself to, to equip yourself to work uh, uh, with some people that you might know. If you want to find out about something that you're not sure about, just ask. There'll be some of us around at the end. We'll have lanyards on. Uh, if you want to ask a question or you'd like us to pray for you or pray with you, or uh, you just want to know something more about the Christian faith, just ask. Uh, and we'll be more than happy just to share those things with you. The book I've chosen for tonight is How Can I Be Sure? Sure of what? Sure about assurance that I am actually right with God. Sure about the Bible that it actually does tell the truth. Sure when doubts come in and the evil one, Satan, just says, are you really a Christian? Are you sure you're right with God? Because your thoughts today weren't in tune with that. And all of those sorts of things, and they can bring us down and put fears in our lives. How can I be sure? There's a little book written by a man called John Stevens just to help us understand that we can be sure because it is God, the sovereign one, who is over everything and brings what we call salvation. And Andrew shared with us last night what that meant. Our speaker for the week, by the way, is Pastor Andrew Campbell. He's from Ballykeel Baptist Church and he'll be closing our meeting this evening as well. Let's just pray together. Lord, we come before you because you are the one who knows everything. And you're the one who knows everyone. And you know us all here tonight. And we thank you that you've allowed us to be here tonight, to hear something for us that we might maybe take to ourselves because we need it or something you share with us that we might be able to tell to someone else who needs it. But all about the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who, as we often say here, loved the world so much that he came at the Father's behest, who loved the world so much, that we would not perish, but by believing, by turning to him, away from ourselves and away from the ways we were going, we would have eternal life. Lord, we ask that everyone here tonight will have that assurance wherever we find ourselves. And we want to ask you, Lord, to do that because it is your spirit that moves in the lives of men and women, young people and boys and girls. It is you, God, who receives the glory and the honor because it is of you. Your word tells us salvation is of the Lord. What a wonderful gift. What a wonderful God you are. Lord, we ask your blessing in the name of Jesus. Amen. By the way, towards the end of our meeting tonight, everybody's welcome to stay for tea and coffee. We'll open those doors. The, the tables are set out in there. Just go in. You can spend five minutes. You can spend 50 minutes. It doesn't matter. We're not in any rush. Or if you have to go on, uh, that's fine uh, as well. We're going to sing a lovely song. We're going to be led in something that's called uh, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. It's based on an old hymn. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. He is everything to us. In the modern uh, way of understanding this, the word cornerstone is put. I say modern and yet it's ancient because the book of Peter, First Peter tells us that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, the most important part of the building. And the building 
as his church. Thanks, guys. to Cardiff Baptist Church and Pastor Dennis Lyle and I were just reminiscing about those times. Uh, he was a pastor before me and on arriving there this name kept popping up, Albert, Albert MacDonald. I have to go and see Albert MacDonald. I, I had no idea who Albert MacDonald was, new church to me 
Then I found out he was involved in a, in a work that was very special, very significant down in South Armagh. So we had to go down, and we did. And I was introduced to Albert. And we jumped forward a few years. Albert came to work with the church, worked alongside me. So we worked as partners for seven and a half years. As I introduce Albert to you tonight, uh, let me tell you we have some things we thoroughly agree on and some things we don't, but we keep that quiet. It's got to do with football and stuff like that. We made a pact a long, long time ago on that. But here are the important parts. Albert is dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves the Lord. He follows the Lord. He loves the Lord's people. He loves the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's presently pastor of North Belfast Christian Fellowship, which some of you may know as the old Andrum Road Baptist Church. And due to step down from that in some capacity, retire uh, in a few weeks' time uh, from that. He loves his own family. I got to know Albert, got to know his family as well. Lovely people. But he loves the man on the street. Now, whether that man on the street is lying in a gutter, whether that man on the street has just stepped out of a chauffeur's Daimler, that man is more likely to have some issues that are beyond most of us in understanding, never mind being able to help. Albert's the one who steps in and bridges that gap between that person and the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what their background is. It doesn't matter if they have been involved in terrorist activity from anywhere. He steps in because he sees the need and the compassion of Christ is with him. Albert, thank you for coming tonight. You're going to tell us a wee bit about addiction, part of your own story. And immediately after that, Andrew's going to, to close off our evening. Thank you. Thanks, Albert. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for your, your kind words. Good to be with you uh, this evening. Uh, let me tell you from the very beginning, this is not necessarily my, my story. Uh, it's a story about a God who, who goes a distance, a God who uh, goes into the far country and, and recovers uh, the lost. So thank you for the opportunity uh, to share with you this evening. I was uh, brought up on the Ormer Road, uh, the lower Ormer Road, in a wee street called Hatfield Street. Um, my mum and dad were, were brethren people, went along to Armour Road uh, Gospel Hall. Uh, so the message of Jesus Christ uh, was not strange to me. Uh, we were sent along to Sunday school, to church. Uh, I've said this so often, I, I was convinced it was eight days in a week, not seven, because I seemed to be at church constantly. Uh, and uh, So that, that was our, our upbringing. But in 1969, uh, when the Northern Ireland Troubles came, we, we had to leave our, our home. And, and that was something that was to begin a change in, in my life. We left the Ormer Road and we moved into uh, Beaver Park Housing Estate. And I realised then that this was an opportunity to, to lose that identity of, of the McDonald's being good living and, and being told when, when you've done something wrong or said something wrong, uh, that you're supposed to be good living. Nobody knew me, uh, nobody knew my family. And in 1969, 1970, uh, growing up in a housing estate, it was, it was all too easy uh, to become involved with, with gangs that led into the paramilitaries. Uh, I took my first alcoholic drink at the age of about 12 or 13. Uh, I happened to be out with... Uh, the gang, uh, about 30, 40, 50 fellas met up night after night, part of these tartan gangs that, that roamed the streets in Belfast. And looking back at it, uh, I, I see now the danger signs. One of the older guys handed me a, a little dumpy bottle of, of harp and said, here kid, uh, do you want a drink? Uh, the good part of my head said, my, my dad will kill me. Uh, and, and the other part says, this will make me fit in. And that's exactly what that done that night. Before I even lifted that little bottle to my mouth, I stood there among 40 other guys, and I remember thinking, if someone drove by here, there's no big arrow over my head saying, 
you're different. You don't fit in. And alcohol began to make me fit in and feel normal. And that was to lead down a road of alcoholism and, and addiction. Uh, even in those teenage years, there was danger signs of, of drinking quicker, of drinking more than anybody else whose company I was in. I met a little girl uh, called Hazel. Uh, I think she was about 14. Uh, I was 15. Uh, we fell in love. She had big, dark brown eyes, long hair, away down her back, and, and I had won the prize. Uh, she, was, she was my girlfriend. Uh, we got married uh, in 1980, and on the eve of her wedding, her, her mother took her aside and said, do not marry this guy. It's still time to call it off. He said, she will, he will destroy your life. And that's exactly what I done. I destroyed her life. The girl that I once loved, the girl that I stood before a, 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 an altar and took as my wife, I, I began to hate her. And in fact, one night, I, I, in a drunken state, I actually tried to kill her. I came to my senses. The, the bedroom was racked. The bed was turned on its side. There was furniture that was smashed. And I had no recollection of that whatsoever, but I had this little girl that I once loved by the throat, and her, her face was, was purple as I tried to, to strangle the life out of her. Uh, alcohol be, became a, a, a demon god in, in, in my life. But I could stand here for the next two or three hours and tell you stories about addiction. You could walk down in the morning and walk into any public house and people will tell you stories. I want to be very plain tonight. I want to tell you about Jesus Christ. I, I want to tell you about a God who rescues, a God who recovers, uh, and a God who heals and, and builds lives and marriages again. Uh, my, my addiction had become chronic. I woke up every morning, and the first thing I would have done was reach down to the side of the bed to, to lift a, a bottle that, that hadn't been finished. I drove down into work. Guys, I, I wasn't down and out. I wasn't living on the street. I wasn't picking up fag butts uh, from the gutter. I was managing and director of, of a business in Belfast. I was, I was doing, on the outside, uh, doing relatively uh, well. Uh, but each, each morning I drove down the road at, at quarter past seven, half past seven. I had a, 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 a tin of beer between my legs and that's, that's how I started uh, my, my day. But I, I want to bring you to a, a place where God started taking a, a, a dealing uh, in, in my life. There was a, a friend, a business colleague, our, our company accountant, a man by the name of Ronnie Bain. Some of you may have, have known him or, or know his family. And uh, I, I knew Ronnie at a distance as, as being a, a good Christian guy. And Ronnie contracted leukemia and I was taken home to be with the Lord. But I want to bring you to a day that was the beginning of a change in, in my life. And I'm going to give you a fair warning. I'm, I'm, I'm going to present to you tonight three questions that were presented to me this particular day. Ronnie got buried on a Saturday morning, and uh, I decided I would go to his funeral around in Carried Off Baptist Church. I purposely left it late to leave the house so that I didn't have to go into the church so that I, I could stand outside and keep myself at a distance. The service finished and I come home and my wife said, what are you doing home? And I says, funeral's over. And she said, did you not go to the graveside? And I said, well, no, you don't, go, you don't do that. That's, that's for family. That's, that's a private place. And she says, no. She says, you cannot go in mourning. She says, without a drink. And you don't want to go because it's going to take time and she was right we had a bit of a row and I says okay I'll, I'll, I'll go I'll go but in my head I knew rightly that I would go down to Beaver Estate and I would, I would carry on drinking but this day was to be different I went to the grave and there was a man called George Bates who was taking the funeral service I'd never met him, didn't know who he was knew nothing about him but later on he told me that God the Holy Spirit had told him that day very clearly 
that there will be someone at that grave and you need to speak to him. And as he conducted the service, he said he looked around, he knew everybody that was standing in front of him, they were Christian people, and as he was speaking, his heart was saying, God, where is this person that you want me to speak to? You told me last night, he had stayed up all night, prayed through the night, that, that God would bring this person to him. I arrived late because I went home, and he told me later on, about two years later, he says that God told him, as I walked down through the graveyard, there's the guy that you need to speak to. And he'd done an amazing thing. He turned his back on everyone that was in front of him. And he pointed his finger at me. And he asked me the first question that day that was to start to transform my life. And I'm going to ask it to you tonight. His question was this, as he pointed his finger at me. He says, what are you going to say? when you stand before Jesus Christ in eternity. And I was, wow. You see, I had rehearsed a script that I was going to say to God when I stood before him. I was brought up in a Christian home. I went to Sunday school. I've got Bibles and pictures and books for attendance and good behavior. My mom and dad are Christians. My father's a lay preacher. But that question haunted me. What are you going to say when you stand before Jesus Christ in eternity? Because I knew that I would. And I remember standing looking at that guy and he, he, he asked me some time later, he says, Albert, what did you think? And I says, George, you were about five seconds away from getting a smack in the mouth. And I was dead serious. I mean, who does he think he is pointing his finger at me and asking that kind of question? I don't care whether you're at a funeral or not. I will knock you into that grave. I will knock you clean out, man. And I walked away. And my intention that day was to go to my father-in-law's house. He, he would open a bottle of whiskey, would set out a few beer, and, and we would see the, the, the afternoon out. I didn't do that. I went home. Question still haunting me, Albert. What are you going to say when you stand before Jesus? I got to about three o'clock in the afternoon, and I went out, and I bought 12 tins of, of Smithwick's beer, my wife was out shopping. I drank 11 of them. I put them into a bag, tied it in a knot, and put it into the boot of the car. And I left one tin sitting in the working kitchen. My wife pulled into the driveway. I cracked open the tin, and I sat it there, and then she came. And she says, I thought you would have hit that in the head today. And I says, there's no pleasing you. I says, you're, you're always moaning, always giving up. One tin. I'm sitting having one tin of beer, and I says, you're still moaning. I said, come on. Took my little girl, who was about 10 years of age, and I says, come on, let's go. Got in the car, drove down the road, went to the off-license, bought a carry-out, drove to another off-license, bought another carry-out, because that was to do me on Sunday, because the off-licenses weren't open, and we set off a walking around the Giants ring, just at the outskirt of Shaw's Bridge there. Second question came from my daughter. So we walked around the Giants ring, she said, Daddy, what happened to Ronnie? I says, he get buried over there, Belly Lesson Cemetery. She says, where is he? And I says, do you see the big tree just to the, to the left of it where the ground's disturbed? I says, he's buried there. But where is he? Standing with a drink in my hand, drink inside my coat. And I knelt down behind her. I put the drink behind my back and I said, love, don't ever look to your father. Imagine a father saying that to his child. Don't, don't ever look to me. I said, but when Ronnie was a young man, he realized he was a sinner. And he accepted Jesus Christ as his savior. And I says, today, he's with Jesus in heaven. And I stood up and felt a bit of pride that I was able to at least tell the truth if I couldn't love it. You know what the second question was? Daddy, are you going to go to heaven? And it broke my heart. I remember standing in the middle of Jan's ring crying. I looked at the tin and I threw it over a wall. And I said, I don't want to live like this no more. I turned to walk away. And she had a hold of my coat. And she asked the third question. She says, Daddy, where are you going? Within a matter of hours, those three questions were to start a change in my life. 
What are you going to say when you stand before Jesus Christ in eternity? Are you going to heaven? No messing about. No bull. Just direct. Do you know you're going to heaven tonight? Third question. Where are you going? I walked back to the car. I went home. I lifted my two carryouts and I went up into the bedroom and I closed the bedroom door. And I said to myself, this is the last night that I will battle with this. It will not go beyond this night. And I started praying. And these are the exact words I prayed. God, if you take this away, I'll become a good Christian. And the reason that I know that exactly was I prayed that prayer so many times. Trying to do a deal with God. God, if you do this for me, then I will do this for you. I remember thinking, God, you don't hear me. You don't hear. And I reached under my pillow. And under my pillow, every night, was a 9mm pistol. And I took it out, put a bullet into the chamber, and I went, I'm finished. I don't want to battle this no more. And I put the gun to the side of my head, and this thought came to me, what about your wife? What about your children? I said, in six months, they'll get over it. They're better off without me. And I wanted out. I, I just, it, it wasn't a game, it wasn't a gesture, it was, it was real. And then that question came booming back into that wee bedroom. What are you going to say when you stand before Jesus Christ? Because a second after you pull that trigger, you will have to in some way answer that question. And I fell off the bed onto the floor and I cried and I cried and I cried and I prayed this prayer, not rehearsed, not even thought of. And I said, God, this has got nothing to do with alcohol. This is sin. And I'm a sinner. And I need your help. I woke the next morning, came downstairs, went about her business. And my wife came to me about 12 o'clock on that Sunday. And she said, Albert, has something happened? And I said, no. I said, why do you ask? She says, it's almost 12 o'clock and you haven't had a drink yet. You know what I said to her? It's Sunday. <laughs> and she said, it hasn't stopped you any other time. I didn't drink for three months. Things were looking up. And then we lost a little baby in the family at about three months old and the responsibility of that fell on, on me to, to break it to the parents and to, to sort out the, the funeral and everything else. And I remember thinking, I, I need a drink. I deserve a drink. Went to the off license and I bought a, a bottle and I, I said, one drink, just tonight, just tonight. The next night was the same. The following night was the same. And two years later, I was worse than I ever was. 1995. Went on holiday to Spain. And on the first night of the holiday, my wife said, Albert, I want to speak to you and I'm going to say no more. I says, what is it? And she says, I'm going to say it tonight, first night of the holiday, and then do what you want. I says, what is it? And she says, will you let me make you an appointment to see a psychiatrist? I says, do you think I'm too lolly? She says, do you think I'm cuckoo or what? And she says, you're not right. There's something not right in your life. She says, even your friends. She says, walk away from me when you get in, into that state. I remember sitting thinking... Is she right? I can't remember coming home from that holiday. I can't remember being on an aeroplane. First thing I remember was driving down the motorway at Glen Gormley and thinking, 
how did I get here? My last memory was standing in a bar last night ordering full glasses of, of whatever I was drinking. Get home. I realized that day, Saturday, the marriage was over. There was no conversation, there was, there was nothing. And Hazel had made her mind up that that was it, there was enough. She was trying to raise up three little children, three girls. Sunday morning, I, I said, I'm going to go to church. She never even answered. I went round to Kerry Duff Baptist Church. I sat down. I hadn't drank for two days. I started to sweat. I started to shake. It got worse. It got worse. There's two little girls sitting in front of me and they were nudging each other, looking round and laughing. Sweat was dripping off my nose. I was holding on to my sleeves as, as I tried to control the, the, the shaking. And I looked down and I realized I'd wet myself. And I was like, I need to get out of here. I need a drink. And I got up and I literally run out of the church. The chairman of the company that I worked for went along to that church and he followed me out. I could hear him running after me and I got to the car and I dropped my car keys and he put his hand on my shoulder. And I turned around and he stepped back and he says, what is wrong with you? And I said, Dennis, just walk away. It's not worth it. And he says, you can't drive a car. He, he says, not in that state. And he brought me around home and dear love him, he, he just burst into the house, uh, wanted to help so much. My, my wife was in the kitchen, uh, drying dishes. And, and he says, Hazel, Hazel, uh, uh, Albert needs help. And she dried her hands. She set the tea towel on the worktop. I was standing in the hallway. I tried to change my trousers. Sorry, this is just how it is. My trousers were around my ankles. I could neither get them off nor get them back up. I was basically getting into a seizure. I looked at the door, and there was three little heads from the oldest down to the youngest peering out the door at their father at their superhero who was going to look after them and protect them. And I couldn't even change my trousers. My wife came to the kitchen door and she says, do you want to help that? Do you want to help that thing? And Dennis says, he needs help. And here's your exact words. She says, are you going down the St. Field Road? He says, I'm going to take him to the Royal. She says, will you stop at the first bus stop? And you get him out. And she says, to see the first bus that comes down the road, push him in front of it. I don't want to know. And she turned around, picked up the tea towel, and started doing the dishes. Over. Got in the car. Can't tell you the whole story tonight, but God in his grace had allowed me to go down to a place called Ballyard's Castle in County Armagh to do a little bit of work as a favour. And the guy set off to go to the Royal Hospital and he says, I'm going to take you to that place you've been working. And I says, it's, it's not open. It doesn't open until September. And he says, but they'll know what to do. And he drove me down to Ballyard's Castle in Armagh. They brought me in. I remember sitting down for the first night and made me a meal. And I remember looking down at the floor and at my lap. And there was potatoes and carrots all over the place. I couldn't get the fork up to my mouth. I, I tried both hands to, to, to try and control the shake. And big aunt, dear lover, she just simply got up, went to the drawer, lifted a spoon set the spoon in front of me and she says, Albert, try the spoon. I remember sitting crying and going, is this what this has come to? Managing director of a business, a husband, a father of three children. You can't even feed yourself. Two or three nights into that stay, I couldn't sleep. I, my head was in turmoil. 
There's a Bible sitting. Something says, why don't you read the Bible? And, and, and what? And what? Tell Hazel that you've changed. Tell, tell people you've changed. And then two months, three months, four months down the road, just go back to the, the same old stuff again. No. But that just kept going on. And around about three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, I, I lifted the Bible. I went, what, what did I read? And I opened it and I read these words. Let, let me go back to earlier that day. Charles U. Pritchard, who was the, the manager of Valley Arch Castle at that time, came to speak to me. And I put my hand up and I says, Charles, just let it go. He says, I don't understand. I don't understand why I do what I do. I don't understand the things that I've done in, in my life. The people that I've hurt, the lives that I've destroyed. Because with, with the, the Alkim a lot of aggression, a lot of violence. And, and I says, I don't even think God can help me. And he went to speak and I says, Charles, please, I don't understand. I just don't understand. That night I opened my Bible and I started to read and I read these words. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And I was like, wow. That was the last words I spoke. Today I don't understand. And God got my attention and I sat up in the bed and I said, God, are you speaking to me? And all I heard in the next hour was read my word, read my word, read my word. And I read it and I read it and I read it dozens and dozens of times. And I said, God, I don't get this. So I'm going to take one word at a time and I'm going to pray. So I read trust. And I says, God, is that the problem? Do I not trust you? And there's times in my life, maybe times in your life, where you've trusted God. And that wasn't the answer. And I went through that, that passage and I came to a little word, all. And I thought that was so insignificant and I, I wanted to jump on. And God said, stop. Read my word. And I says, is this it, God? He says, all your heart. You've never, ever, ever given me all of your heart. And I said that night, 13th of August, 1995, God, if I give you all of my heart, will you set me free? He says, read my word. And I get down off that bed and I says, God, I give you everything I have. Everything. I give you my life. I give you my home my family, my wife, my kids. Just set me free. And he did. I went home. My wife came down and says, Albert, the marriage is over. Don't want you to come back to the house. I want you to find other accommodation. He said, I've been married to you 16 years. I don't know you. There's people have been on the phone. There's people have called to the house. Do, do you know that he was involved in this? Do you know that he'd done that? She says, I, I, I don't know you. But by the grace of God, he healed the marriage. I promise it said to God, everything you have, my little girl who was with me that night at 12 years of age tried to take her life. Went to see her in the hospital and on, on support. And I says, why love? Why'd you do this? She says, Dad, you ruined our lives. And I just want to ruin yours. I come out of that little room that night. My wife was sitting in the corridor. She wouldn't go in to see her. I asked her sometime later. I says, when, when was the first time that you thought this was real? She says, the night in the hospital. I was convinced you would walk out of that room, come out the door, and tell everybody where to go, and head straight for the first off license. And I asked you, I said, Albert, what are we going to do? And I said, we're going to trust God with all of our hearts. And that's what we've done. And God healed that marriage. A wee girl is now walking with the Lord. She runs her parent and toddlers at Andam Road. And God's been good. I'd love time just to tell you exactly what God has done in our lives. I haven't done it four years later. 
I gave up my employment and I went back to Ballyhards and I took over the management of that establishment for, for almost seven years. God, give me a verse and I've never forgot it. I, the Lord God, have chosen you to build a house. Be strong, courageous and do all the work that God has asked you to do. Building into lives, structures and foundations to build homes, to build families rooted in Christ. May God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Albert, for your, for your honesty. And it is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others he can do for you. I'm going to read from God's Word, from John chapter 3. As I said last night in these meetings, we're going to be looking at incidents in the Bible whenever the Lord Jesus Christ met people and how their lives were transformed, just like Albert's was transformed in 1995 of their meeting the Lord Jesus. A very familiar passage of scripture, John chapter 3. We'll read the first 21 verses. This is the word of God. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who come down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, But whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. We end our reading at verse 21. We thank God for his precious word. Let's just pray for a minute together. Our Heavenly Father, we are... So thankful for your precious word. We thank you for these wonderful words in John chapter 3 telling us of this late night encounter with Nicodemus. And as we unpack these verses, we pray for help from heaven. We thank you for Albert's story, a story of your amazing, astounding, astonishing grace. We thank you that he trusted the Lord with all his heart. We thank you for saving We thank you for restoring his marriage. We thank you for saving his children. Thank you for using him at Ballyards and using him right now in the Antrim Road. And we pray, Lord, as we just study these verses briefly this evening, that you would just speak into our hearts. Pray especially for anyone here this evening unconverted, still not a Christian, that even tonight, Lord, as your word is explained and expounded, that God the Holy Spirit would speak, would bring conviction, 
and draw men and women, boys and girls to yourself. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. A young girl was asked why Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and her answer was he couldn't wait until the morning. That may be true. But this very religious man called Nicodemus has a late night classic encounter with the carpenter of Nazareth, Jesus. This is one of the most remarkable meetings in Scripture. If you're familiar with John's Gospel, the Lord Jesus has just turned water into wine in chapter 2, followed by the encounter with the money changers in the temple. And the chapter concludes chapter 2 with the, the truth that many people have trusted in Christ for salvation whenever they saw the signs that he had been doing. And in chapter 3, John presents us with a description of salvation, that of the new birth. Last night we looked at three questions regarding this wonderful word, salvation. John here refers to it as the new birth. Four things quickly we see about the new birth in those verses we read together. First of all, we see the new birth demanded, the new birth demanded. We're introduced to this man, Nicodemus. He was a religious man. He was an influential man. He was a ruler of the Jews. He was one of the Pharisees, one of the ultra-conservatives of the day. He had reached the highest levels of Judaism in the Sanhedrin. He was morally impeccable. He was intellectually competent, but he was lost. He was unconverted, and he needed salvation. Now, the Pharisees knew the word of God, but they didn't know the God of the word. And Nicodemus is a seeker. He's he's seeking to see who Jesus is. And as we see this encounter with the Lord Jesus, we see that God has been working in Nicodemus' heart. He has heard of the the miracle-working carpenter from Nazareth. You may be here this evening. You may be a church-going person. You never miss a service at church. You pay into church. You may even have a role in church, but maybe tonight you're not yet a Christian. You may be here tonight and maybe someone has invited you, some of your family have invited you, you're here under protest, but listen, God is always working in people's hearts. And deep down as you sit here this evening, you may have questions, is the Bible reliable? Is it true? Is there life after death? Could I be forgiven for all my sins? Nicodemus has lots of questions. And and we see here he, he respects who Jesus is. He shows him admiration. He says, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher sent from God because no one can do these signs unless God is with him. So Nicodemus has insight. He has wisdom. He has perception. He was respectable. He was religious. And he was restless. And he knew deep down that there was something missing in his life. Something that all the religion couldn't satisfy. And he didn't know exactly what it was. And so he comes to Jesus with all these questions running through his mind. He was quite prepared for a a theological or a philosophical discussion with this man, Jesus. But Jesus cuts right to the chase. He goes for the jugular. He goes right to the very heart of the matter and he shows us here that new birth is absolutely demanded. Nicodemus knew the Old Testament scriptures. He knew God had promised there would be a coming king who would set up his kingdom. He probably wants to ask the big question, are you the coming king? Is the kingdom of God at hand? And Jesus, as God, can read his mind. He knows exactly what he's thinking. And he tells him in verse 3 that the key to entering God's kingdom is to be born again. Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Three times Jesus uses that particular phrase, most assuredly. Listen very carefully, Nicodemus. What I'm going to say to you is of the utmost significance to your life. And this statement bemuses Nicodemus. It blindsides him. And he says, how can a man be born again When he's old, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? And he uses exaggeration to say that he he knew he couldn't go back into his mother's womb. He knew a person had to experience a, a fundamental change. And deep down, 
Nicodemus wanted to experience this change in his life. He's desperate for reality and he's desperate for answers. And whenever Jesus mentions being born again, he doesn't know how to get it. But I believe this is the heart cry around our world tonight. People longing for a new start. Longing for reality in their lives. Longing for renewal. And to them it seems as difficult as it did to Nicodemus going back into his mother's womb. Does that describe you here this evening? You know there are things in your life that need to be changed. You know that God is alive, that the Bible is true. And as you sit here this evening, you're just longing for a fresh start. Jesus can do that for you. He did it for Albert. He did it for his family. He told Jesus, Jesus tells Nicodemus in verse 5, how this can happen, how someone can enter God's kingdom. Listen very carefully. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless someone is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And secondly, we see the new birth explained. Nicodemus would have known what Jesus was explaining there because John the Baptist has been baptizing people in the Jordan River on repentance of sin, a symbol of their repentance. And John knew that the non-negotiable of entering the kingdom was not baptism. No amount of water can save anyone. The key thing is repentance. There has to be a change of heart. It happened with Albert. And repentance is at the very center of the gospel. This is the first step, Acts 17.30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men, all women, all boys, all girls everywhere to repent, to have a change of heart, to do a 180 degree turn. Repentance means to be sorry for a sin. Agreeing with God that we have broken his commandments, that we have missed the mark, that we have crossed the line. The new birth absolutely requires repentance. If you're not a Christian here this evening, will you honestly confess your sins to God? He knows all about it. He knows all your struggles, all your sin, all your secrets. Tonight, you don't need to turn over a new leaf. You don't need reformation. You need regeneration. You need to be born again. And the Lord Jesus Christ drives the truth home again in verse 7. You must be born again. You must be born from above. You must be born supernaturally. And if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, the implication of this encounter in the Scriptures is that if you want to go to heaven, you need to have a new nature. And to get a new nature... You need to be born again. And to be born again, you need to repent. You've been born physically, but you haven't as yet been born spiritually. That's the thrust of this verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The question isn't here tonight are you religious? It's not have you been baptized or have you been confirmed. It's not are you moral or are you decent or are you law abiding. The question is, are you born again? Have you given your life, all of your life over to Jesus Christ? Because if you do, things will change. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If you repent of your sin and believe the gospel, the change will be radical. The change will be life transforming and eternity changing, just like Albert's story here tonight. The new birth demanded, the new birth explained. Thirdly, the new birth illustrated. Jesus tells Nicodemus that the new birth is just like the wind. They may have been sitting outside. And the late night wind was blowing around them. Jesus said the wind blows where it wishes. We, we can hear the sound of the wind. Especially in a storm. But you can't see the wind. You can see the effect of the wind in a storm or a hurricane. 
And the new birth is very much like this. It takes place according to the sovereign will of God. We don't have the power to bring about the new birth. God does it. And just like the new birth, the wind is invisible. When a child is born, physically you can see that child, you can hold that child, you can embrace that child. But whenever a person becomes a Christian, whenever they're born again, there's no change to their physical appearance. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's an internal work. Conversion goes from the inside out. And one of the symbols of the Spirit and the, and the Word of God is that of the, the wind or, or breath. God's Spirit is like the wind, just it's invisible. But He's also like the wind, very, very powerful. We can't see the Spirit, but we can see the effects of the Spirit in a person's life. They recover from addiction. Whenever people get saved, God changes them. <coughs> No one can fully understand the wind. And the new birth is a total miracle. And just like the wind, the new birth is unpredictable. No one knows when it will take place. Perhaps you've come to this meeting tonight and these things have been playing in your mind for a while. Just like Nicodemus, you have questions. You've concerns, you've troubles, like Albert's daughter. Are you going to heaven? Where are you going to spend eternity? Perhaps nobody else knows that God is working in your heart by the invisible Holy Spirit. But you would love to find peace. You would love to find forgiveness. You would love to find assurance. And Nicodemus was like, and he was bemused by all of this. And he says, how can these things be? He's still trying to think the new birth is a physical event. The penny hasn't dropped. And Jesus says to him, are you the teacher? He was the top man teacher in Judaism, in Jerusalem, and he couldn't understand it. And you do not know these things. Nicodemus, you've read the Bible, you've read the Scriptures, you don't understand the Old Testament Scriptures pointing to me, pointing to the atonement that I would make. You don't get it, Nicodemus. The second illustration Jesus gives him is that of the serpent. This would have been very familiar to Nicodemus. He takes him back to the book of Numbers. Whenever the children of Israel had sinned, they complained about spending so much time in the wilderness. They moaned about the manna. And God sent a plague and they were bitten by poisonous snakes. And the Lord told Moses, here's the remedy. I want you to make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, and all who look at the bronze serpent would live. No matter how badly bitten they had been, no matter how sick they were, the opportunity of salvation was there. All they had to do was look and live. And that analogy the Lord Jesus brings to Nicodemus is that one day, the person speaking to him would be laid up, lifted up on a cross, and all who will look to him by faith will be healed spiritually. They'll be born again. You see, the snakes that attacked the Israelites were symbolic of sin. In fact, the perfect symbol of sin because it was the serpent who tempted Adam and Eve and that was the the beginning of sin coming into the world. And whenever the Lord Jesus Christ was lifted up on that cross, he became sin for us. Romans 8 verse 3 tells us, For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, he condemned sin in the flesh. And the Lord Jesus tells Nicodemus, the look of faith will save you. The look of faith will give you new life. Perhaps you're here this evening and you're hesitating on becoming a Christian because you're trying to work up enough faith You would love to believe. You would love to be saved. But you just don't have enough faith. Those Israelites dying in the wilderness 
probably had many doubts too. They probably hesitated, but eventually they exercised faith. They looked at the brazen serpent and they lived. Listen, don't try to work up enough faith because you'll never do it. Don't look at your look. Look to Christ. See him hanging on that cruel cross, bleeding to death between two thieves, paying for our sins in the darkness and loneliness of the most momentous day in world history. Last week as we close, the new birth provided. All of these illustrations are followed by a great explanation of the greatest verse in the Bible, John 3 and 16, a masterly moving summary of the gospel. We haven't time to fully expound it here this evening. You may have learned it in Sunday school. Most people in Northern Ireland church circles know this verse all by heart. Two wonderful truths in this this verse as we close. The depth of the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave. He demonstrated the, the, the depth of his love by giving his beloved only perfect spotless son and if love is measured by its value then God's love for us could not be greater. He gave his most precious possession the apple of his eye his only son and he gave him up for a world of lost sinners. God couldn't love us more than this. But this verse we also see the scope of God's love that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John's readers would have been familiar with God's special love for Israel. But his love has always been all-inclusive, indiscriminate. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, his love has shown so freely at that cross. It's for the whosoever no matter how ill-deserving we feel, no matter how inadequate we feel. And we're not sure if Nicodemus was born again that particular night or it happened later, but it happened. Because whenever we meet him at the conclusion of John's Gospel in John chapter 19, he's with another man, Joseph of Arimathea. And those two men took the body of the Lord Jesus Christ down from the cross and they laid it in a brand new tomb. Nicodemus may have been a a, a secret believer for a while. But more than likely he was at the cross. And he had seen the Lord Jesus Christ lifted up from the cross. Dying for the sins of the world. Dying for his sins. Dying for mine, dying for yours. And Nicodemus was born again. Steve McQueen was one of the great actors of the late 60s, early 70s. It was said of Steve McQueen in those days, every man wanted to be like him, every woman wanted to be with him. Someone once asked Steve McQueen if he believed in God, and he replied, I believe in me. God will be number one as long as I'm number one. All the money, cars, alcohol, drugs and women that anyone could ever have were at his fingertips. And it was only a matter of time before he became addicted in every way. And Steve McQueen in the the 70s had had actually climbed to the very top of the Hollywood superstar ladder. He had a string of major hits. Such as Towering Inferno and Bullet. Steve McQueen could name his price for a film. But he he became absolutely disillusioned with Hollywood and he... Uh, retreated to the solitude of his ranch in Sun Valley, Idaho. Steve McQueen thought it would be a good idea to learn to fly. He bought a plane over the phone for $35,000 and he, he contacted a man called Sammy Mason to give him flying lessons. And Sammy Mason was a Christian. And Sa- Steve knew there was something different about him. And the more time they spent together, the more time 
More, time, more Steve wanted to know what was Mason's secret. What, what made him different? Why was he so calm? Why was he so, so composed? Why did he have this peace that Steve McQueen had searched in vain for all his life? Steve McQueen's mother was an alcoholic. Steve McQueen never met his father. And one day he asked Sammy Mason outright, and Mason sat down beside Steve McQueen and he explained what, or rather who, was the difference in his life, and he said it was Jesus Christ. McQueen told a friend, Sammy and me would fly, and he'd tell me about the Lord. Flying and the Lord. I learned about the Bible. I'd listen and fly, it made sense, it made me feel good. Steve McQueen started to attend a church, Ventura Missionary Church. And three months after he started attending a church, he had a conversation with the pastor, Pastor Leonard DeWitt. And in the course of their meeting, Steve said to the pastor, you want to know if I'm a born-again Christian? And the pastor said, Steve, that's right, that's all that's really important to me. McQueen quietly revealed that during a service a few weeks earlier, whenever the pastor had invited everyone to pray with him and accept Christ as their Savior, he had prayed and it had happened. Yes, said Steve, I'm a born again Christian. Six months later, McQueen was diagnosed with an incurable form of cancer. And he met the pastor and he told the pastor, he said, Leonard, now that I know Christ, I really want to live. And I believe that God could use me. But if he doesn't heal me, it's okay because I know where I'm going. One of his last visitors was a man called Billy Graham, who gave Steve McQueen his own Bible. Steve McQueen died of a heart attack shortly after cancer surgery. And he died with Billy Graham's Bible on his chest, opened at his favorite verse, John 3, 16. A verse that God has used to bring many people to faith in Christ. Perhaps you memorized that verse as a child. Tonight in the gospel, the Lord Jesus calls you to himself. He died on the cross for sinners. He shed his blood for sinners. He has finished the work. All we have to do is trust him. Believe in him. Repent and believe. Look and live. And you will be born again. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gospel that is the great news, the greatest news this world has ever seen or ever heard. We thank you for the greatest verse in the Bible, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you that we are Still tonight in the day of grace, there's an opportunity for anyone here this evening, not yet a believer, not yet saved, to trust Christ, to be saved, to be forgiven, and to be set for heaven. Thank you for your precious word. Thank you that the new birth is available and accessible even tonight. Thank you for Albert's story. We pray you continue to speak as we close in song. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. hearing about the amazing grace of God, we're going to sing about the amazing grace of God. And remember, some of us will have lanyards on if you'd like to talk to us, or just go to a table, take a book, take a book for someone else if tonight's story and tonight's teaching has been for you or someone you know. And then don't forget, tea and coffee in here, I'll go to that door, but you make your way in here as well if you'd like a cup of tea. Thanks guys. <clears throat>
should also have said, if anybody wants to chat to Andrew or to Albert, just go to them, and if they're free, they'll speak. Listen to some words that have been mentioned this evening as we close in prayer. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Lord, we pray that the blessing of your word by the power of your spirit will bring about new birth, new creatures in Christ Jesus for your glory. We thank you, Lord, that this is still the day of you creating those new creatures. May your blessing be upon us, the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray.